kind of news of the week or something. Um, so for example, today, um, how many of you use Chrome, the browser? All right, so uh, I don't know if it's in the main, like main channel yet, but Chrome, I think it's 94, um, is about to come out or just came out. Um, and it has an idleness API. Uh, so in other words, if you are not actively using the computer or not actively on the tab uh, that it thinks you're on or whatever, um, applications like websites can find out that you're idle. So in other words, if you're say in a class in Google Meet, you can, I could tell if you were idle, if Google Meet added that stuff with that feature. Uh, for this class, so that's kind of on the privacy side, for this class, what's particularly interesting is uh, based on your idleness, I might be able to start to figure out when you tend to go to lunch. So I might be able to feed you ads, right, based on when you typically go to lunch by doing essentially data analysis, right? Uh, and taking that data set, hey, I've got this whole group of people who tend to eat lunch around 1 p.m. on uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so why don't we feed a bunch of Taco Bell ads right back, right? Um, so both, like, the, I, I have software in this uh, kind of area of software from two things. That is really cool, and that is really scary at the same time. So uh, just kind of be aware. That's uh, so. Hopefully, I'll try to figure out a way to like incorporate that into the lectures more often. Uh, I just happen to be reading that on the way over here, uh, so I thought that was interesting. All right. So as promised last time, um, we are introducing this assignment, um, um, and I meant to post this on Piazza right before class, but I forgot. Uh, do you want to? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, for those of you who like to read, um, there's kind of this write-up, which, like I said, will be on Piazza in a minute. Uh, but essentially, the idea is use some sort of format with your team um, to try to create a guide that somebody would use uh, to review for the midterm. Okay, uh, Many of you might be really good at this already, like whatever high school you went to or, you know, if you're not a freshman, for example, you might have a lot of practice with this. So that's why we want to do it as teams so that you can, uh, you know, kind of glean from each other how to go about this. Um, I would do this as slides because everything I, or a lot of what I do is slides, right? Um, uh, Google Doc, for example, would also be a fine alternative. Uh, in fact, I saw a review guide for this class that's a Google Doc. Um, and, but another neat thing to do, which would be better practice for you, would be to actually do it as a Jupyter Notebook. Um, so that's another thing to consider. Um, and oh, so one thing I just kind of want to add as a note, so it's cut off the screen here, um, but is if you need help writing prose in Jupyter, because we haven't really covered that too much, uh, let me know and I can tell you how to do it. Um, basically, what you want to use is something called Markdown. Um, Let's see, so ideas for topics to include, uh, you know, keywords from the various lectures, you know, my little like magnifying glass thingy, um, methods and functions that we've used. Um, you know, we're gonna introduce a couple new ones today, um, but things like select, right? Um, then kind of Python basics, how to actually make a method, for example, which is something I consistently get wrong for getting this colon. Uh, so that would be another example. Um, and then types of graphs when you use them, uh, and then other things that come up, obviously, there are a number of lectures between now and the midterm, so there will be stuff we haven't talked about yet that would also land there, right? Um, but we don't want this to penalize anybody, so if your team decides not to submit uh, anything at all, uh, then you just don't get any bonus points. If your team submits the best one, you get five bonus points. Um, I suspect the midterm is going to be uh, between 70 and 90 points, I haven't quite figured it out yet. So five points is material, right? Um, but I'm not sure if it's closer to 70 or closer to 90. So there's that. And then so and then everyone who submits one but isn't a leader and it's, you know, at least okay, uh, will get three points, okay? That makes sense to everybody? All right, you think this will help you study for it? All right, cool. I think it will. Um, and... Uh, We'll see what happens. All right. Uh, I think that was it. Yeah. All right. Um, 
also, oh, actually one more quick thing. Um, we know there's at least a couple students who actually haven't been assigned to a session, uh, sorry, a group. Um, if, if any of those people are here, uh, please see us afterwards uh, so we can make sure we get you assigned to a group. Uh, if you're aware of your group, that's totally fine. You're in the right one. There's no confusion. We're not changing anything. It's just there's a few people who uh, were not in discussion when we did the group assignments uh, that still haven't gotten a group. All right. Uh, so I alluded to this last time, um, but this is a, a fun little graph. Okay. I'm sorry about the poor image quality. Um, but as you can see, um, if Bush tax cuts expire, all blankety blank is going to break loose, right? Like that's really bad, right? Like everybody's going to have to pay so much more money, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Except down here in kind of the fine print, you can see this, okay? Which is if you actually scaled it from zero, that's not actually that big a gap, right? Um, so, you know, politics aside, clearly has an agenda, right? This is the real, this, this gives the person viewing the picture a more accurate understanding of the data, right? Um, so I just think it's kind of entertaining. And, and what's, what's wildly challenging about this, right, is it's not wrong, okay? Like it says 35% here, and it says the bottom of it is 34%. Okay, it's just that when you look at that, you do not get this feeling, right? So going back to bull shrimp, my youngest son's favorite term. Um, all right, so moving on to content or more content. Um, I think we have a couple more examples here today. Uh, if we can find, oh, sorry, I wanted to show you. So this is the data eight uh, page that I referenced. Um, so as you can see, it has links to slides and you know all sorts of other stuff. Um, a bunch of these links won't work, by the way, uh, because they're behind like Berkeley's uh, student firewall. So if it doesn't work, that's why. Um, you know, and uh, just kind of keep that in mind. Um, I have access to a bunch of them, but I'm not allowed to redistribute them. So just kind of keeping that in mind. Uh, all right, distributions. Uh, yeah, I think we do a demo first. Oh my God, that thing is really annoying today. Let me see if I can get it over here. All right. Doing the right thing. Yes, we are. All right. So, first thing we do um, is load that up. It looks like it works. Okay. Um, and we're going to move on to distributions, but uh, kind of to get us started, uh, we're going to do a little bit of stuff that we talked about last time. Uh, so we're going to load that top movies uh, uh, data set again. Um, so just, you know, for recall, right, title, studio, gross, gross adjusted, and then the year. Uh, and then we're going to do another thing we did, which is make it a little easier to consume. Um, how's the size on that? Y'all can read it. A little bigger. Let's see if I can hit that like presentation mode thing. That and then uh, uh, is that better? Okay. Um, so then we're going to add the millions column. Okay, by basically uh, rounding it to three significant digits, make it a little simpler, and dividing by a million. Um, and then someone's going to call me. Uh, and then, uh, so now we have, you know, a nicer graph, uh, that you know, a, a way to do a graph, right. That gives us a little bit nicer data. Um, one thing I want to point out is if you notice, right. Uh, we had, uh, like 200 ish, actually, I think it's exactly 200 rows in this table, right. We had, it showed us 10 and then there's 190 admitted, um, omitted. Um, but this one only has the 10. So what we use for that is this take operator. And I don't think we've talked about that one yet, have we? All right, so what that does is takes rows by index, okay? So in other words, the position in the table 
is the index, right? And it's going to be zero based. So if I wanted, you know, I don't know, every 10th one, right? I would say zero, 10, 20, 30, uh, and you take, and it would just pull those individual rows out and then make a new table of just those rows, okay? So can anybody tell me what I'm doing right there? Right, because, so we're going to take 10 rows because we're going to do an empty array, which means give me an array back that is zero to nine, right? Um, and then I'm going to actually, that will return a table. So watching those parentheses, okay? Then I'm actually going to do a horizontal bar chart uh, and then do a little bit of labeling, right? And so column picking. Um, so I could as easily, well, not as easily, but I could also have, Typed in an array, right? I could have done like a make array or something um, and said zero, comma, one, comma, two, right? Um, but leave, right? So, so I don't do that. Um, does that make sense, everybody? We're going to use take a couple more times, but it's just kind of handy to actually be able to like individually pick out rows sometimes. Um, this is actually the least interesting example, to be honest. It's much more common you want to use something like that when, when you want like arbitrary rows for some reason. All right, let's see what's next. All right, so now we have, um, okay, so we have the top movies. Um, what we're gonna mess around with is primarily just the studios, okay, that produce the movies, like MGM. Um, how would I get a table of just that data? I don't want anything else, just the studios. Did you have an answer? Okay. Yeah, select by column name. So, right, and then uh, to print our result, I'm gonna spell studios wrong. So this is why I try hard not to type in class. Um, so that list of studios, right? Uh, we still have 200 of them, but do we actually have 200 of them? Or do we have, we have 200 rows, but do we have 200 studios? No, why not? Right, there's duplicates, right? Um, you know, <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't be America if there were, uh, if it was consistently always one. Um, okay, so what if we want, oh boy, I really got ahead of myself there. Um, so what if what we want to do is we want to look at the studios, um, we want to collapse that data, right? So we want to think about that data in terms of, um, you know, what did one studio do, right? Uh, any ideas how you might do that or a guess? With a group, okay. So um, this is why we assign the reading in advance, and you can uh, have some hints about this. Um, so we can use another function called group, uh, which is super handy. And because typing, I will cut and paste it. So what do we do here? Okay, so we take our our piece, right, uh, and then we say, okay, you know what? I want to group the things together. Uh, and only have the individual studios. Uh, or like I only want everyone to appear once. Um, and then, and we're gonna assign that to the studio distribution, uh, which is cool. Um, and then we are just gonna take a look at what it is. Um, because how many columns do you think that table is gonna have? That it created. What do you think to be a studio distribution? Come on, back to the class. What do you got? What do you think will be in studio distribution? So the actual, so the studio name, right? And then account of those things. Um, because otherwise, it probably wouldn't be very useful. Um, so as you can see, we have, um, you know, now we're down to. Uh, 23, right? Because we're showing 10 and we're admitting 13. 
So we add those up and that's uh, 23. So the thing is, uh, so we know we had 200 rows before. So if we add all of these up, these numbers in the count, how many should we get? Two hundred. Um, so, how would I go about verifying that without actually adding them up? Because I can't. Add. All right. Somebody else, come on. Any ideas? Really? Nobody? All right. Um, remember, you have the Jupyter Notebook, so you can play around with things before you have to like answer. You can just try a bunch of stuff and see what happens. Um, all right. So what we can do is we can take that studio distribution. We can pull the column, right? Um, and then we can sum the column. And that should give us 200, right? And it does. So it means we didn't screw anything up, which you know for me is a pretty low barrier. Uh, all right, so let me just make sure I'm in the right place here. Yeah. Okay, so then what we can start to do is we can maybe make some different bar charts, right? So what we did before was we just kind of took essentially the data that was in the table and plop it on a chart. Um, here, if we start to think about group, we can actually manipulate the data, sort of, right? We're not really changing it as much as, um, you know, kind of looking at it from a different direction. Uh, so what we can do is instead, we can now actually visualize that data set, um, except it's kind of yucky. Right. Um, so, what things might make this um, table better? You think? Yeah. Slim. Well, let's actually we can use this as a good sidebar. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about the other day was. We were talking about you can always go and kind of look at the uh, data set or the actual tool chain and we can just look for slim right or one of the things i usually do is actually have the documentation open so we don't have a slim all right but oh uh limit um why limit Okay, so yeah, that might be useful. Maybe I just misheard you. Um, I got you. That is a that is a weird um, contraction, I guess, uh, because it it's difficult to parse. Um, all right, so maybe we do y lim. I don't know what the parameters are, so we're gonna go here and do y lim. I was on the table. Uh oh. Now I'm going to look like done. Oh, uh, no, that only works on the. Does that only work on the arrays? Yeah. So it may not work for what we want to do here. All right. So we'll cheat and uh, move on to it. So one of the things that I think would be useful would be just sorting it. So let's put. Um, all the biggest numbers at the top, right? And all the smallest numbers at the bottom. So what we can do, all right, but can we do it here? Uh, let's see, sort by, um, descending equals true. Not where the character that is. All right. Theories, you think this is going to work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yes. What do you want to say? Okay. Same. Okay. So you are correct. Okay. I'm not going to do that because I want to show it broken. Okay. And the reason I want to show it broken is, or I'm hoping it's going to break correctly, um, is because the output here is this graph, right? So, so it doesn't know what it is kind of anymore, right? And so if you notice here, what it says when you try to pull the sort, it, this, this error here, and this is one of the problems with writing everything on one line, is that uh, you don't get a lot of detail about where in the line the problem is. Um, so sometimes it's easier if you break it up. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna show you really quickly you get an error like this and you go, what? I don't get it. So this is, if you remember from last time or some time ago, um, you can do this, okay? So type will tell you that it's none, okay? Um, I'm actually surprised it's still printed, um, but whatever. So it tells you, so, uh, I'm not 100% sure why it says none type, but the, the type when you're using it in the language is just none. Okay, so I'll usually just say none, but it's none, right? Unlike, and when we were messing with this before, that's the data sciences table table, right? Okay, so we can operate on that. But we can't operate on a none. A none is uh, basically nothing. Okay. Um, and one thing, this is a distinction that a lot of people find confusing in computer science, data science, basically anything related to kind of tech is none, or what's also referred to as null, is not the same as zero. It's literally nothing. Okay. So I can have zero apples, right? Or I can have nothing. Right, they're, they're not the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for example, one of these studio movies could make zero dollars or they could have nothing. So in other words, they didn't make a movie. There's no movie, there's no way to value how much that movie is because it didn't get released, let's say. Then it, that's more like a nothing, right? So a lot of people find that very confusing. It will lead, uh, it often leads to a lot of errors when uh, like a data set, for example, kind of implies that a zero is a nothing and vice versa. So it's something to kind of keep uh, keep in mind. Um, I don't know if we'll talk about that. We might talk about that more later, but that's something that like off by one errors is ridiculously common. All right, so we're going to put that sort back in. Then we're going to do the bar H um, and studio. Just put it right there. All right, so now we have them sorted, okay? Um, and then one other thing we wanted to do, um, you know, we could start to, you know, maybe we only take the top 10, right? So it's an easier to read because maybe we don't care about the ones that are, you know, down here, right? So we can say, take, Range. Um, so, oh, I did this backwards. Wait. No, that might work. Yeah, goes off. Oh, no, next time. Oh, that did work. Um, so, you know, so now I just took the top 10. Maybe not quite what I wanted. Maybe what I actually wanted was anything that was greater than one, you know, or something. I don't know. Uh, you get the idea. Um, so, but kind of going back to that, uh, that error I got a few minutes ago, daisy chaining kind of too much stuff results in when you make a typo or a bug or whatever, um, it's much harder to figure it out. So when I'm doing something like this the first time, I will normally do it in 16 sets, right? Um, not daisy chaining till I get it right. Then I'll actually go back and sometimes put it back to a daisy chain because it's easier to read. 
but to, to parse it out to make sure I got it right, I'll do pieces. And then the other thing that I would mention too, which um, you know is going to come up, I think you know for the project and stuff like that, is that um, like the counter check we did earlier, where I actually summed up the thing. I'll actually introduce those in the middle too. Be like, do I still have two hundred rows? Just not sure. Um, you know things like that. Just while I'm kind of going through it to make sure I got it right. All right. Um, I feel like I lost. Yeah, we might have gotten a little ahead of ourselves because I, I had a cool little thing that said, go to the slides here. Uh, and it seems to be MIA now. So um, let me, so I think we want to kind of cover those things real quick in kind of pros. Okay, so when we are talking about distributions, wait, sorry, I'm like, why do I feel like something's like missing? Let me just see what the next slide is, sorry. Oh, I think maybe I jumped to it earlier. All right, but so here's some terminology based on what we were kind of just talking about, right? Um, so the reason I point this out is sometimes we have slightly different terminology for different things. I'm not sure how my stupid little uh, magnifying glass got moved around over there. Um, but so individuals, we talked about that a little bit, right? So any individual, when you talk about these distributions, um, how features uh, are recorded, they usually, or they should only have one value per variable. Okay, so like the studio, uh, or sorry, a movie, you know, only made X amount of money. It didn't make X amount of money, and then somewhere else it said it kind of made a little bit more, right? Um, so it's just kind of one data set. If you have a data set that isn't like that, you you would be much better off to kind of collapse it, right? Unless you need that distinction. But this goes back a little bit when we were talking about like the census data. And we were pulling out like just the women. So we dropped the sex column, right? Because it's superfluous um, and it's repeated. So in kind of the same way, unless there's uh, distinguishing characteristics about that individual record, it's often better if you had the studio thing, for example, if you had three listings for that movie, that's particular, that's weird, right? Um, because you know every other data element is the same and it's just different dollar values are those numbers that you should add together? Are they numbers that are supposed to be subtracted? Is one overhead? Is one what the actors made? Who knows, right? So 99.9% .9 of the time, right? It should only be an individual has this particular value for a variable. The other thing we're introducing here a little bit is the term variable, which I know I've used a bunch, but we haven't really kind of defined, but we have, it's also got a whole bunch of name collision. So a variable is another term for an attribute. I will usually use the term attribute because you remember all the names in Python? So when I say studio distribution, right, um, is assigned to that table. Whenever we say a name that's also in, as a programming, in programming, we refer to that as a variable, okay? So I'll try usually to use attribute when I mean this thing, but some people, some documents, some, you know, whatever may use the term variable. So just kind of be aware. Um, a value can be numerical or categorical. Okay, so this is the difference. If we go back to uh, that. this. So categorical might be the studio, right? And then numerical might be the dollar values. Okay. And then And yeah, each individual has exactly one value. Um, if you see something where that's not true, there, there might be something broken. Um, and then for each different value of the variable, the frequency of individuals that have that value, okay? So this is the studios or the, like the, you know, how many movies they had, right? Or, um, yeah, I'm not being a good example. 
all right, does that make sense? This one's a little, I don't know, I found this one clunkier than most, but, um, you know, yeah. So we talked about uh, the distribution of categorical variables. So this is kind of what we were talking about with the uh, categorical distribution, right? So instead of looking before, we just looked at like the gross amount of money that a, a particular movie made. Uh, instead, what we're looking at is we're aggregating data based on a particular data element. Then we're using that to figure out how many there are of that thing, for example. And then we can kind of start to look at that data. So now we're looking at the categorical data, not the numerical data, right? We're manufacturing, in a sense, numerical data with the counts, but it's categorical data. <coughs> um, oops. <clears throat> Sorry. Why is this? Yeah, my little pointer thing being missing is really throwing me off. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so. <coughs> So visualization, so bar charts are commonly used to categorize or to visualize categorical distributions. Um, you know, one axis be the category, one axis be numerical, and it switches depending on the basically ease of consumption, right? Um, and then if I, let me just check my other slides here. First, nothing's going to load quickly. Yeah, okay. I think I'm back on track, hopefully. Oops. All right, so, and when we're displaying categorical distribution, so then we have the distribution of that variable, column, studios. Um, it describes the frequencies of the different values. And then what we can do is use the curve method, which we talked about, uh, to count the number of things uh, for that value in the column. Um, basically, it does exactly what it sounds like, right? It groups based on a particular thing, uh, and then, but it gives you back how many of those items there were. Um, and then we can look at the categorical data that way, right? We can do it by category. Um, and then the length of the bar of the count is individuals. And then, um, and you can you can also manipulate the order of them right based on things like sort right all right everybody getting this even though i'm like a little disjointed today yes good all right cool all right so then we're not really going to do a demo yet we're going to first talk about binning so Binning and counting the number of numerical values that lie within ranges called bins. Okay. So uh, hopefully you're kind of glancing at this and getting a pretty quick idea of how this works. Okay. Um, so, first up, where does 188 belong? So, somewhere in this neighborhood, right? Which, which one? If you're going to toss that in one of these bins, which one would you put it in? Right. So 188, it's about here. Oh, good. This is built on click. So, oh, kind of ahead of myself. Um, it's always a problem with these path ones. Uh, so it lands in here. So now we have an item in this bin, right? We don't care where in the bin it is. It's just, we added one to the bin, right? Now, where would 170 go? That was supposed to be a tricky one, right? Because it's like we've been talking about kind of um, ranges all along, right? Inclusive at the bottom, exclusive at the top, okay? So it's inclusive. So therefore, 170 lands in this bin, right? Then, let's see if we can do this right this time. Um, 
if we do 189, what bin is that going? This should be getting easier. Between. So we don't have a bin for 189. We only have a bin that's 185 to 190. Yeah, so it goes in the 185 to 190. Yay! All right. And so we, I just realized this is correct. Um, so we have this kind of range in here, right? 185 to 190. So that's the bin that it lands in. So now we have two items in there, right? We have one item in that one. Okay. You probably see where this is going. Um, all right, so what about 163? Like I said, it should be getting easier. Right on. All right, so 160, 165. Let's uh, do a couple more. 183, where's that go? This is a good opportunity for participation points. Right. All right, and then I think we have one more, maybe? I don't know, where's 168 go? Of course, my, my real kicker one, right? The 171, right? Um, 189 is inclusive. Um, I should have probably put in something like, um, oh no, 189 is good, right? So it would fall within the range. Uh, one of the things to remember, uh, if you have a numerical data set, right? Uh, make sure you have enough bins for all the things, right? Otherwise, bad things are going to happen. Uh, and this is where another fun place where off by one errors are pretty regular and common. Um, okay, so 168. I want somebody else. All right. Nice. Uh, and oh, I did it again. I did all this time building the build slide, man. It's got to work. All right, and then we get one more in the 170 range because we have 173 and then whatever, right? Um, okay, so now we really will do a demo and hopefully I'll stop the right place. Um, so to kind of set it up, we're gonna look at numerical distributions for the top movies. Um, so, does anybody, can anybody translate, like give another way of saying numerical distributions in terms of the category stuff? Any ideas? So for me, what makes it easier to remember, right, is that what you're doing is turning numerical data into categorical data, in a sense. You aren't literally, but you kind of are, right? Because instead of saying, uh, I have the numeric value 183. I'm saying I have this bin. So it's almost like a category now, right? So at least for me, it makes it easier to kind of remember and think about, um, but you, you kind of op have to operate them or set them up slightly differently. Um, but that's not too big a deal. All right, so we have these top movies. Uh, we have a bunch of dollar values, um, but I think we're actually gonna look at something else. Sorry, changing windows. All right, so what's the first thing? Okay, so, oh, sorry, I, I should have pointed, oh. Yeah, I think it didn't save my file, stupid thing. There might be other bugs in here. So it should be this, um, and so this should be this, because uh, otherwise other stuff's not gonna work right. Um, so one of the things I just mentioned about the bins, okay? What do you have to make sure you have enough of? Right, or you know, how do you, if you have the bins, what do you have to do? You have to make sure you have enough bins, right? Um, oh yeah, I'm particularly disappointed because um, I had a fun picture for you. We're just not winning today. I don't know what the deal is. Um, yeah, because every time I see the term binning, um, who here has been through airport security? Every single time I see that word, all I can think of is the bins and the security and you put all your stuff in it and then put them through. Um, like that's immediately like binning, that's what it sounds like. Or the British version of the same term, which is like to throw something in the trash. Um, so those are not what we're talking about here, but you know, there it is. 
Okay, so anybody have, so how might we find uh, what the range of our bins are if we want to talk about ages? Okay, so we've just added this age column. So we don't just have the year, right? We have the year subtracted from now. So we know how old the movie is. Okay, so we're going to operate for the rest of this block on the ages. So how might you figure out what bins you need? Right. So the first thing you want to do is figure out what the bottom of the bit, like the smallest bin, right? And the largest bin or edge, right? So does anybody know how to do that off the top of their head? Yeah. Uh, so, but what, okay. So that would be how to make, or potentially a way to make the bins, but I need to know what the edges, the bin, like the edges of the, all of the bins needs to be. Right. So in other words, I need the most recently released movie age and the oldest released movie age. Do you have that answer? Good answer. Good answer. So one way to do would be sort it and then do a take on the bottom and the top. I have an easier way. Uh, any other ideas? Yeah. Right. Max and Min um, or you know, there, as with all programming of any kind, there's always multiple right answers. Um, it's just what we look for when we're programming is the most efficient and what we usually refer to as the most elegant solution. Um, anybody here taking uh, like any serious level math classes? Okay, so you know what theorems are though, right? So one of the things about theorems when they're writing a theorem one of the things that's really important is that the theorem is developed elegantly, right? So you can have a theorem that's proven in an ugly way, and you can have one that's proven in a pretty way. Um, and so, and pretty is like efficiency, understandability, you know, kind of all those uh, considerations. So, you know, so sometimes referred to as pretty, sometimes referred to as elegant. Um, so the example I use a lot is the traveling salesman problem. Does anybody know what this is? Did I talk about this in class before? Or is it a different class? Okay. So anyone know what the traveling salesman problem is? Right. So you're a FedEx driver, right? And you want to deliver packages. You have 10 packages there. And let's say for the sake of argument, 10 uh, locations to take them. Do you want to do that in the most roundabout way or the most efficient way, right? Uh, so that's actually a very difficult mathematical problem, uh, even if you have very good data, like you, let's just say for the sake of argument again, that you can just go straight lines, right? You didn't need to worry about roads, even that it's still a hard problem. Um, so some number of years ago, uh, so there had been pieces of what's called the solution space that had been proven using elegant mathematical proofs, okay? But there were also big chunks of it that had never been proven. And no one had found an elegant solution for the whole solution set, okay? So uh, kind of giving up on the elegant solution for the whole solution set, and this was in not early days of computers, but I actually was at the conference when I was in college where the guy who did this um, like announced it, it was like the keynote, right? Um, what they did was they sat down and actually wrote a program and tested them all, all the rest of the space, right? So, you know, just for, you know, to simplify it, right? Uh, up to 10 stops had a nice elegant solution. You know, 13 stops to 22 stops had an elegant solution. You know, uh, 25 or 23 to 36 had a different one. And then, you know, 36 on had another one. But that gap of whatever I said originally, as I make this up, you know, 10 to 13 had never been proven. So they sat down and just tested them all, right? Uh, it was a lot bigger problem set than three, but you get the idea. Um, so long and short of it is, you're always looking for the most elegant solution. Um, and so one of the things that, why I actually often compare programming to writing rather than programming to engineering is because much like writing, you, much, you do a much better job every rewrite, right? So rewrite, rewrite, rewrite is what they always tell you with writing. Programming is a lot of the same way. So I might've started with um, your solution, and then like, okay, you know, and then come back and then like, oh, I can do this, I can do this better and then fix it, all right? So moving on, beat that dead horse. Um, 
where was I? Okay, so based on that, we want to make some bins, okay? And the, the like result that we need is an array of bins, okay? So we're gonna do this. Um, and if you notice, they're not the same size necessarily, and they don't have to be, okay? They conveniently were on the slide I showed you. Um, and sometimes they're easier to understand when they're the same size, but they don't have to be. Um, did anybody notice any problems with this? Oh, sorry. I actually thought it printed my bins. My bad. So we have all our bins. And then to put them in the bins, we use conveniently the command called bin. Um, so we've used name parameters before. This one has a name parameter called bins. Okay. Uh, and in this case, what we do is we're presetting that my bins array, okay, and then we're uh, using that here. We could make it, you know, arguably more efficient, but arguably less easy to read by actually just moving that make array directly there, right? But that might be confusing to basically make it really long. Well. Um, so now we have. all the data in bins. Um, and I thought we had, oh no, okay. So, ah. so why do you think we chose, so why did we choose 100 here? You see any problems with that? Right on. All right. So in this data set, our max is actually 100, right? So as a result, we're dropping one of our items on the floor. Okay. So if you added these numbers up, what number are we going to get? Anybody remember? Uh, let's see. Some. Let's look at something. Yeah. In data. Dot. Hopefully, I'm doing this right because you know. Wait. Oh, my bad. No, it's inclusive. So it is including it. My bad. Uh, it's exclusive. No, it's exclusive. It should be wrong. And you have a zero on your table for it. Right, there should be one here, right? At least one. Um, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I'm doing something wrong because that should not be in the bin. Huh. All right, uh, we'll figure it out. So let's play around with it some more, see what's going on. Um, maybe we could say, all right, anybody have any? commands that we could use that would tell us what the top or the, the oldest thing is. Yeah. So that'll tell us the, the top one, but I want the actual row. Yeah. So where, and then it's age. Greater than, let's say, yeah, let's just say 90. Oops. Oh, right. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know why I think it's greater than. Oh, I'm in the wrong table. It's uh, top one. Yeah, so we have we have at least one. 
Um, so the reason is that you were correct is that the top of it was exclusive, but the, the bin here is a label. Okay, so it's not really the number. So if we do in the right place, if we make this 101. Oh my goodness, I don't know what's going on. This should work. I don't know what I'm, I'm doing something stupid that I'm not noticing. Sometimes that happens. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. It's right? Yeah. But where's the last one? Where is this guy? Oh, oh, because this is the bottom of the page. Yeah. So, sorry. I was like, I know I'm doing something stupid. Yeah, it's uh, that issue. It's right. Fine. So it's 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 in this bin, right? Sorry about that. Uh, as you see, I make a lot of mistakes, um, even when I have cheat sheets, but I try to make the cheat sheets better, and normally they are, I think. Um, all right, so now that we stop screwing around with that, um, what if we want to make, and somebody said this, but what if we want to make the bins automatic, right, and we want them to be uniform in size? Let's say we want them to be each, you know, uh, uh, 25 movies each, or sorry, 25 years each. Okay. So we'll drop that in here. So, yeah, so this is where, so I think I was mixing these two things up. So, in this one, though, we do have to do a range that's higher than the 100, right? Because otherwise, the 25 won't jump far, far enough. So we get enough bins for everything, and then and they kind of get broken up by uh, 25. Um, and we use the empty range so we don't have to type it out. But now we have uniform distribution. Um, you know, sometimes you don't want that, right? Like the kind of the example I showed earlier, where we have a bunch of studios that only produce one movie, right? Maybe instead of displaying that, we want to you know consider that bin or whatever um, you know of one, just put them all together, but then have uniform bins after that. Does that make sense? Right, because I just want to say, okay, there's 30 studios that have one, but then what's more interesting is we have, you know, 10 studios that have, you know, I don't know, 10, you know, less than 10 movies, you know, 10 that have less than 30 movies, et cetera. So I, I think that one is, unless you see examples, is a weird one to follow. Um, all right, and then, yeah, and then we already did a where example because we were trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. Um, and yeah. All right, so what we can do now though, is if we have my bins here, which is still set to the um, uh, variable width bins, right? Um, then we can, start to do cooler things by, let me just do it this way here. We can actually make a histogram. Okay, so does anybody know what a histogram is? Anyone? All right, this is one of those, go ahead. So, for me, it's it's basically a bar graph, right? The thing that's different about it than a, like like a bar graph is almost like a, you know a subset in a sense of a histogram, but like because a histogram can have variable width bars, because a histogram the bars and this goes back to our beginning thing with the uh, tax cuts, the bars should represent the data in the same size, and actually. We'll have, let's do a better example first. Before we kind of execute that. Oh, we have time. Okay. So 
This was uh, a real ad, supposedly, um, that uh, Gizmodo, which is a tech blogger, um, found. Uh, and so the previous iPad and the new iPad, the new iPad is 100% bigger battery than the previous iPad. So what's wrong with this picture? So arguably, you know, did you go from, you know, 10 minutes to 20 minutes or did you go, you know, um, arguably, yes. But no, this is specifically about the graphic. What's wrong with this graphic? And we've kind of alluded to it a couple of times so far. But this is exactly the same problem. Go ahead. Yeah, you're getting in the right direction, but you don't. Um, Got exactly the same problem as the as the text cut picture in that this is not a hundred percent bigger than this. It is more like two or three hundred percent bigger graphically. If you sit stood here with a ruler and actually did the math, it's actually quite a bit bigger. And then because of the internet, um, and I was showing this to Graham earlier because I thought it was hilarious. Uh, so somebody actually kind of went and did the like research with the comments and stuff. So those things are, those graphics, right? It's meant to be representing a 3D volumetric space, right? So if you look at it from that perspective, it's actually like whoever did the math or they actually calculated out the volume. And it's like, you know, on just in 2D, it's like 200% different and then 300% different if you look at it in 3D. So it's quite a lot different. It's not 100% big, like, like at least the picture is not. So we have no way of knowing what 100% bigger in this case means. So what that takes us to is what is referred to as the area principle, okay? Um, that should probably have a little uh, magnifying glass there. So an area should be proportional to what it represents, okay? So we have A, we have A here, right? And we want to say double A or 100% bigger. Okay. Is B valid? Is C valid? Is are both valid? So we'll do a show of hands. Is B valid? Raise your hand. Okay. Is C valid? Raise your hand. All right. Are both valid? See, I don't think anybody raised their hand for C. Probably not. Um, and that's correct. Okay. Because even though the way I produced uh, this was by taking one of these and making it 100% bigger, it's not, right? It just, you know, this, this is the problem with graphics, right? So I think it's kind of neat. So when we talk about drawing histograms, um, we, as the chart that displays the distribution of numerical variable or uh, attribute. So like I was kind of saying before, it, like for me, at least, it almost turns that numerical number into a category. Um, and then there should be a bar, or generally speaking, right, there's a bar for corresponding to each bin. Um, and then the, if it is using the area principle, you, can, you should be able to discover the actual values by calculating the size of the box, or, you know, with, with a ruler, kind of, okay? Um, then so you want to talk about density first? Um, yeah, let's wait. Okay, so if we go back here, we can actually look at it. So, most people find, or at least you know, I do, I think a lot of people do find. Uh, this kind of graph a little confusing because you don't see them very much because what we did is our bins are evenly distributed so as a result the graph or the bars are not evenly distributed they match the bins does that make sense okay so what can we do instead we've kind of already done which is 
use equally spaced bins, right? So we know how to do that because we did it a minute ago. Um, and then we pull a histogram off of that. Now this is no more or less accurate, right, than the other one. Uh, it's just most people are more comfortable seeing uh, bar, you know, graphs that look like bar graphs, basically. Uh, they're not usually that used to seeing histograms. But the prior one can be important, kind of going back to the, you know, the studio thing is like, you know, do you want to just kind of ignore the studios that only did one movie? Then a good way to do this would be non-normal distribution. Uh, and so, you know, you would end up with kind of a big bar at the beginning, but then everything else should be distributed evenly. So you, you can kind of have people focus on the parts that you're trying to tell people about. All right. Let's see. Um, the other cool thing about a histogram, uh, or sorry, about the, the function hist, really, okay, is that you don't actually have to give it bins if you don't want to, okay? Instead, it can just, to a larger extent, it can kind of guess them for you, right? Um, as long as it's a normal distribution, um, you know, and it's one of the things where you try it and, and see if it gives you what you want. Um, otherwise, you give it more explicit instruction. Okay, um, you know, can, for this thing because it's it's a really nice range. In fact, right, zero to one hundred, um, it's pretty good at figuring out a good distribution of them. Um, but yeah, so that can come in handy, um, and then. I think we'll just kind of show this. Well, I don't know, that's fine. Um, so let's go back to the slides. And I think we're probably done with the notebook. But all right, so basically, you know, the hist command uses a scale. So you see normed. Okay, so um, does everyone know what the term normalized means? All right. Somebody want to define it? Yeah. So yeah, so normalized can mean basically it's it's kind of a weird thing, but it's make everything normal, but it's not really normal. It's make everything similar, right? So it might be in your example, right, where you're trying to you know maybe you have movie studio uh, money in yen and in dollars, so you want to normalize it to all be in dollars, right? Um, so that would be one way to do normalizing. Um, this is another verb form of the word normalized, okay? Um, where it's normed. Um, it might be a real word or it's a contraction because programmers, um, I'm not, I can't remember. Um, so, but norm just means that this has been normalized, okay? So in this case, the scale will be normalized unless you set it to false. This is like sending or norm. Um, so by default, it'll use a scale of the whole data set rather than, you know, like a partial data set, which is what we, one of the problems we saw with the bar graph, right, is that it wasn't doing the whole data set. And so therefore it was like skewing your view. Um, that was in the last class. Uh, okay, so the area of each bar is a percentage of the whole horizontal axis is a number line, um, but they don't have to be an equal size. And then the vertical axis is a rate. Um, so, yeah, basically, you know, those are kind of the different parts of the histogram, um, you know, but the big, the big distinguishing characteristic, right, is that if it's a kind of proper histogram, you should be able to tell by looking at it, the actual values of the, the bars, okay? Um, I recommend putting in labels of the values as well, but, you know, this is fine. All right, does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Uh, see all right and so kind of very briefly um that's not the same book um okay so you can actually calculate the height right by uh taking you know 52 out of 200 is 25 and a half percent but then it's 65 to 40 uh so it's 25 years wide right you can subtract it um and then you can calculate the height of the bar Okay, 
So, um, you know, this is literally what Python is doing for you, right? Um, and then the height measures the density. So the uh, percent of data in the bin is relative to the amount of space in the bin. Um, and basically you can get crowdedness or density. Um, so does everyone know what we mean when we say density? So if you imagine that the picture I did first when I was pulling the pieces away, the build slide. So the density is how tightly packed in things are in the like individual bit. Okay. Um, density is a very common word in computer science and data science um, in that it's often really important to know uh, the density of something. So like, you know, how much stuff do you have packed into some individual place and how much can you have, um, you know, for your laptop example, how much file storage do you have, right? The density of your hard drive is how many files you can pack into there, okay? Um, so, and then, and then the units are, you know, per unit on the horizontal axis. So, so there should also be like some axis, right? That indicates what the, what the input is to the math in a sense, right? Um, and mostly we're kind of talking about like, like I, I don't think this is particularly hard, but it's kind of like, this is the like formal words that we use around this stuff. So you, when you see the stuff, you're like, oh, I know what that means, okay? Um, but a lot of them very much overlap with math, right? So, you know, most of you probably know what an area is, right? When you calculate area, um, that's kind of all we're doing here. It's just that, these terms mean those, those same things in math. Um, and then, th so this is kind of the last one. Um, I think I've kind of beaten this dead horse. Um, you know, a histogram got to be numbers, okay? You got to take those numbers and you got to put them in a bin of some kind um, and use histograms. You can actually use histograms in more sophisticated ways that we may get to eventually, um, but kind of for the sake of argument, that's good enough for now. I regularly think of it as when you are putting those things in bins, you're kind of like categorizing them. Um, bars have arbitrary, right? Widths and spacing, uh, which I think is one of the other big distinctions. So one of the ways you kind of, if you're looking at the graph, tell whether it's a histogram or a bar graph a lot of the time, um, if you don't have a lot of other context. Um, yeah, so. There you go. Good enough. Everybody makes sense. All right. Uh, I hate reading slides, but 